Growing up gay in a southern rural area during the Reagan 80s was a pretty hostile experience. Uh, needless to say, I did not come out of the closet as a teen, and back then I simply couldn't envision how someone like me could have a full life, much less happiness. Morris taught me that happiness just might be possible. <laughs> E.M. Forrester's Morris, the second of his novels to be adapted by Merchant Ivory after A Room with a View, takes on a subject that no major novel in the genre had ever addressed, the problem of coming of age as a homosexual in a restrictive society. First published in 1971 after Forrester's death and long neglected by critics, it is only recently and largely since the release of the film adaptation that it has been reevaluated. Um, Morris was written in 1913-1914, but was not published in the author's lifetime, essentially because the homosexual love story had a happy ending. Ian e. Forster knew Morris would end his career, and I used to wonder why I had trouble conjuring a happy future for myself. I am so thankful that we have so much more awareness of our potential to lead full, healthy lives full of happiness. Um, Oscar Wilde had been put in prison in 1895 and was dead by 1900. Ian e. Forster wrote this story only a decade later. There were very real, deadly consequences to being an out homosexual. Homosexuality was not decriminalized in Great Britain until 1967. In fact, in the film, Morris says, I am an unspeakable of the Oscar Wilde sort. The idea for the novel came because E.M. Forster was an admirer of the poet, philosopher, socialist, and early gay activist Edward Carpenter. And following a visit to Carpenter's home, um, he was inspired to write Moritz. E.M. Forster fictionalized the cross-class relationship between Carpenter and his working class partner, George Merrill, for that of Morris Hall and Alec Scudder. There were some reviews of the 1987 film that found this relationship to be unbelievable because of their class differences. Uh, that reviewer obviously has never had to love under the threat of death. Class differences evaporate. Love does rule. We see a version of this relationship in the great new Swedish Netflix series Young Royals uh, between Prince Wilhelm and Simon. Um, a note found on the manuscript read publishable but worth it. Foster was determined that his novel should have a happy ending, but also feared that this would make the book liable to prosecution while male homosexuality remained illegal in the UK. But Forster said himself, a happy ending was imperative. I shouldn't have bothered to write otherwise. I was determined that in fiction anyway, two men should fall in love and remain in it for the ever and ever that fiction allows. And in this sense, Morris and Alec still roam the Greenwood. There has also been speculation that Forster's unpublished manuscript may have been seen by D.H. Lawrence and influenced his 1928 novel Lady Chatterley's Lover, which also involves a gamekeeper becoming the lover of a member of the upper classes. However, this remains unsubstantiated, although it makes a a lot of damn sense to me. We only need to look to the most recent Young Royals to see the continuing influence of Morris today. The creative team of the Young Royals did not mention Morris, but the film's imprints everywhere. Uh, Morris was produced by Ishmael Merchant and James Ivory. They were lifetime partners, and their professional and romantic partnership lasted 44 years until Merchant's death in 2005. They are masters of the costume drama and have influenced basically every English period drama since 1985. Their work includes Howard's End, A Room with a View, and The Remains of the Day. Morris is my personal favorite, uh, with A Room with a View coming in a close, close second, due mostly to Maggie Smith's performance as a Helena Bonham Carter's spinster cousin and chaperone, a woman scandalized by Tuscany. The film was written by James Ivory and Kit Hesketh Harvey. Uh, James Ivory also co-wrote Call Me By Your Name, which I'll revisit at the right time. 
Uh, starring James Wilby as Morris and Hugh Grant as Clive, two Cambridge undergraduates who fall in love. The film is set amidst the hypocritical, homoerotic subculture of the English university in Forster's time. Uh, Morris was shot on location largely in the halls of and quadrangles of King's College, Cambridge, including interiors in the college's world-famous Gothic chapel, ironically where Foster was educated and later returned as a fellow. Watching James Wilby defrost as Morris Hall comes to terms with his homosexuality and chooses to pursue happiness at all costs changed my life, and Hugh Grant is brilliant as a collegiately dressed femme fatale. He leads Morris on a perilous journey, then abandons him at the moment of truth. Personally, I think the filmmakers could have taken more liberties. With the movie version, it had been less faithful, meaning much less tediousness, and much sexier. But what we're left with, for me, personally, was one of the hottest big screen sex scenes I'd ever seen. And that was around 1991. Brokeback Mountain's spit as lube sex scene came a very long 15 years later. The very first scene of Morris's set in childhood is very funny, but you have to give it time, be patient. The first scene does a beautiful job of setting up the expectations of Morris during his life to marry a woman and have children, life's cheapest glory. Honestly, I wish they'd focused entirely on Morris's adult life and begun with him having sex with a man. But Merchant Ivory's goal was to remain faithful to the novel, and so the pace has a tendency to suck up. Uh, Morris then takes us into the smug, very rigid world of Britain's privileged classes before World War I. Cambridge, a large upper middle class home in su suburban London, and a deteriorating mansion are the primary locations. This privileged class of which Morris is a part of ritualizes everything to create a comfy, cozy haven, haven for the conservative and conventional minded. In other words, not a world made for a homosexual in 1913. The only glimpses of a homosexual life occur during his Oxford University Greek class. A professor instructs a pupil to omit the reference to the unspeakable vice of the Greeks. Anal sex does not exist. Basically, every character, every person has a perfect version of happiness and a perfect version of hell. E.M. Forster and the filmmakers here have placed Morris in his own personal version of hell that he's hardly aware of. Watching Morris figure out that he is indeed in hell and then watching him emotionally and physically figure his way out is the joy of this movie. E.M. Forster made Morris an ordinary man, a very regular fellow, sort of dull. He's a banker on the verge of leading a very respectable life, except he's a homosexual. Forrester wrote him this way, and for me, it heightens the drama in every way. How does an ordinary person navigate their way out of their perfect hell and into their perfect heaven? It was the opposite for another character of the same period, Edna in The Awakening by Kate Chopin, which was published in 1899. Indeed, she had her awakening, same as Morris, in a similarly privileged society, but she pays for her freedom with her life. I'll talk about the happy ending here, but I won't tell you exactly how he gets there. We need happy endings. Uh, Hugh Grant is wonderful as Clive, whose inability to fight the social mores of the time puts him at odds with Morris. Morris's search for happiness will most likely end in imprisonment if he is not very, very careful. His university friend Risley walks an even thinner line as he is out in, he's an out and proud homosexual for the time and he pays accordingly. Um, as you can imagine, Morris receives little help from his dean, his family physician, who insists that the worst thing I could do for you is to discuss your homosexuality, that has a familiar ring. Since no one will talk about his homosexuality, Morris is emboldened to figure it out himself. His therapist, an American, thank God in this instance, recommends Morris move to France or Italy as England has always been disinclined to accept human nature. Yes, there is funny in Morris, but again, there is no dame in Maggie Smith. So watch Morris for his journey of self-discovery. Morris's journey is really for anyone who finds themselves 
in opposition to society. Ian Forster wrote, struggles like Morris's are the supreme achievement of humanity and surpass any legends about heaven. Kevin Thomas of the Los Angeles Times wrote back in 1987 that the irony is that Morris, in order to cope in his growing honesty with himself, he must become a much better, far more sensitive man than had he been heterosexual. If you loved Young Royals, then you should definitely stream Morris. Uh, the novel's ending occurs some years after the film's ending does, and I find it far more powerful. I've told you the story has a happy ending, but not with who or how, trying to keep the plot spoilers to a minimum here. That said, the ending of the novel suggests the birth of the gay bear, and it's wonderful. Uh, big spoiler alert for the novel, in the last scene of the book, many years later, Morris and his lover are found to have grown beards and to be living in the woods. They sell Christmas trees to make a living and Morris inadvertently sells one to his sister, who is still appalled. But Morris doesn't care and is perfectly happy and at peace with the life he created the Venice Film Festival honored Morris with the Best Director Award for James Ivory and the award for Best Actor to both James Wilby and Hugh Grant. Morris received one Academy Award nomination for Costume Design for Jenny uh, Beaven and John Bright. The clothes are my perfect hell. Um, all buttons and layers. I rip my clothes off when I get home, not a full-on nudist, though. Believe in undies or a thong or something, so I feel less vulnerable. <laughs> um, so all in all, Morris, the film version here, I love for personal reasons. It can be a tad tedious, but wholly worth the effort, I believe. I'll continue to review LGBTQIA plus films from the past, so let me know your favorites, and until next time, always remember, just like Morris figures out, Living well is the best revenge. Yeah.